Welcome back to Inside, Inside the Ultiverse. My name is Thomas Henley, and today we're going to be tackling the concept of autistic infantilization. Due to our differences as autistic adults related to social communication, our outward behavior, basically the ways that we are different from our neurotypical peers, we can receive a lot of unfair judgments about who we are and what we're capable of. People can make thin sliced judgments, interpreting our autistic expressions as certain personality traits, typically negative ones. Think of things like eye contact. For us, eye contact might be quite painful, but for other people, it may be indicators of us being shy, of having anxiety, of being mistrustful, as being aloof or uninterested or unwilling to focus on what someone's saying to us. Equally, our processing time, the time that we take to understand what someone's saying and reply can be misinterpreted as us being unintelligent. And even to a certain degree, us being rude, especially when we are thinking about what someone said and wanting to produce a response, but the other person has already moved on to talking about something else and we interrupt them. They can also deny our autistic needs and traits, either just flat out not believing that we're autistic or not believing that our needs profile doesn't match up with how we present on the outside. And of course, they can infantilize us. This is the more pernicious, complex and very, very frustrating aspects of how people treat disabled and autistic individuals. And it's basically treating us as an infant. We're an adult and people are treating us like we are a child, like we are some kind of vulnerable little baby that they have to coddle and that they have to treat differently to other people just because we have a disability or because we're different. And people usually go one of two ways when it comes to interacting with me as an autistic person. Either on one side, they see my social communicational abilities, my emotional abilities, my ability to do the work that I do. And they say, oh, okay, you seem pretty normal. So you must have no issues. And they neglect to take into account the needs that I have, the fact that I have a spiky profile, that some things are really easy for me and other things not so much, or they kind of go the opposite side. They see me as being a helpless individual that needs support all the time, that needs them to tediously explain different aspects of what they're trying to explain just because I don't agree with them. A lot of people find it quite hard to conceptualize that somebody who is good at speaking and who understands a lot about people's behavior and a lot about the brain, a lot about the science, that they will struggle when it comes to executive dysfunction, that they'll find it hard to manage different aspects of their life. Someone that has meltdowns and shutdowns where they get into very vulnerable, intense states and someone that struggles quite a lot with the sensory environment that a lot of people take for granted. In the spirit of talking about this very hot button issue, let us go into some points, some descriptors of what infantilization can look like coming from myself as an autistic adult who has pretty much experienced every single thing on this list. Number one, probably the thing that sticks out to most people is the change in the way that people talk to you. People tend to use a lot of flowery, cutesy language that most people find a lot more appropriate when speaking to children or talking about children. A common example of this might be interpreting an autistic person's kind of blunt, direct behavior and, and literal thinking as being cute and funny and being like, oh, you, you didn't understand this and sort of patronizing them a little bit with their language. They may use terms, descriptors, which are generally quite inappropriate and patronizing to call adults. But because you're autistic, because you're disabled, they feel like it's okay to do for you. It may even get to a point where you explain something to them and you're very, very knowledgeable about something. <laughs> and they kind of pass it off as like a kid sort of coming up to them and telling them about the new teddy bear that they've saw in the, the store and what kind of features it has. They don't interpret you speaking about your special interest about you telling them something that's quite, you know, complex and quite interesting. They just kind of see it as this cutesy kind of, oh, this disabled person is kind of speaking about something that I, I don't care about. And they just kind of label it as being cute. Basically, as I said, treating it like 
it's something that a, that a child has come up to their parents to say when they, you know, they're trying to relax watching TV or something. Albeit, this is kind of a, a little bit more subjective because some people just tend to use a lot of that language. I've come across some people who say things along the lines of like, oh, bless you, or like, oh, I hope you're okay. And, you know, they, they kind of have that tone to their voice with like anybody <laughs> in that sense but there are some people who don't speak to other adults like that who don't speak to other human beings like that but because you're different because you're autistic they change the way that they speak as i said very subjective thing very context dependent not saying that if you at all use this language towards anybody or use these descriptions about anybody that you're necessarily being infantilizing but if you do find that you know you come across some people in your life as an autistic person who tends to treat you this way as opposed to the way that they treat other people might be something to call them out on one of the more frustrating aspects beyond that kind of subjective nature is ignoring us talking to people around us instead of us when talking about something related to us. You can see this a lot when it comes to medical professionals and psychologists. Usually when it came to parents' evenings or schools, the teachers would quite often talk to the parents about you in front of your face. But to do so in an adult situation with an adult, it's quite patronizing. It's not really something that you want to be doing. A lot of the time, your first instinct, no matter what someone looks like uh, would be to address them would be to ask them because you don't know what their communicational abilities are like and also it's just generally quite respectful to address people even if they struggle even if they're the non-verbal they can't communicate just making that attempt to like see them just communicate with them as you see them just like anybody else that you would just making that attempt can often go a long way for a lot of people it probably will do a lot for their self-confidence it probably make them feel a lot more seen and a lot happier to be interacting with you it can also come in the flavor of tedious explanations you imagine a situation you know a lot about subjects you're talking to someone about that subject they know that you're autistic they know that you're disabled and they just still explain things in such tedious annoying detail because they think that you don't understand this can happen quite a bit if you don't agree with someone if you have a differing opinion the other person may think or think in their mind that you don't you just don't understand that you're, you're being silly you're being slow <laughs> because you don't you don't agree with them in this circumstance and so they react to that by giving you a tedious explanation on why they are right and, and what the situation is like. Perhaps if you prefer to have more of a direct communication style and you're advocating to use that a lot more with people, they may give you a tedious explanation on why you're being rude. It's not to say that some people can't be rude as autistic people because I think they can be sometimes and it can upset people sometimes. You might be in a situation where you go to a doctor and you tell them about your autistic experience, they tell you something about autism and you say, oh, okay, I understand that, but this is not my experience of being autistic. But they just neglect to take on any input from you because they view you as this disabled person that doesn't understand much about themselves and doesn't understand much about autism or their own experience and has kind of this, this warped autistic view on things. Some people can be like that and I have ex had experiences with medical professionals like this. Tends to be, I'll just say, oh, you did a great job and just like get them to discharge me <laughs> because they just don't want to meet them again. Um, there are some people who are like that and can be very, very egotistical and also just, just not take any, any of your input down, any of your experiences down as something that is valuable to the conversation. In the mainstream media, the mainstream eye, a very common concept talked about in the context of disability and autism is this idea of inspiration corn. And it's not corn, I think you can imagine what I'm trying to say. But basically this is where people put autistic people into the spotlight for achievements that they have in order to give other people inspiration. It may not even be that this is a, a big achievement for them in their own eyes, but because it's a disabled person doing it, people like to highlight it. People like to put it in the spotlight 
because it makes other people feel good. It's like this kind of charitable effort that people do. Not often do you actually get autistic people coming on to talk shows, coming on to the news and speaking for themselves. It's usually the parents. It's usually the researchers. It's usually scientists who get to talk about autism. It's not the autistic person coming on to that show and sharing their experiences and opinions and, and really sort of being, being seen as, as an adult. It's kind of like we're used as this source of inspiration for other people. It's a bit of a weird one, and I think it definitely lies somewhere on that continuum of, of infantilization. You also have this concept of autism, A-W-E, autism, like, ah, oh, very much seen in daily life <laughs> as an autistic person if you are infantilized, also seen when it comes to show. A very topical one pops to mind, and that is love on the spectrum. And I'm not particularly talking about the actual individuals on the show, but I'm talking about the production choices, how they decide to sort of tediously, like weirdly introduce an autistic person as, you know, liking these these very strange things, but these, these very strange things are... <laughs> <laughs> are pointed out because they're quirky and p people will find them funny and like oh look at this autistic person who doesn't like car fresheners and <laughs> likes to take strolls on the b the beach with his dog and a, and a stick that is is picked up go stick collecting even though this person might have a lot to their personality they choose to use these things and they they do it on purpose they do it on purpose because it's quirky and strange and it's out of the box and it kind of adds to this this air of cutesiness this air of autism they also choose to use like whimsical cutesy kind of do 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 do, do. they use like the kind of this 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 weird sort of whimsical cutesy music uh to play in the background of situations like that and very much highlights different aspects of their communication on camera, like they choose to to include those aspects of, of them, typically because it's it's out of the box. It's not typical. It's a little bit different to how most people would interact with another human being. They might even put a lot more focus onto the parents, to the people around them, instead of actually fully just talking to that individual as an adult who is going on to a dating show. They might really, really highlight and include bits from parents or friends or or people around them um, to speak for them and speak about their experiences when they, they should really be focusing on the individual, the adult. And this isn't to say that autistic people can't be cute. I mean, it's pretty much the, the most common descriptor that I get from like people that I meet that, like, oh, you've got a cute personality. I'm like, oh, thanks. I hate that. <laughs> I don't hate it. It's it's okay. It 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 kind of I'm getting used to the 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 concept of being called cute, but it does feel a little bit patronizing and infantilizing sometimes. I don't know about you. Let me know down in the comments your thoughts. I'm not saying that I don't like Love on the Spectrum. I think the actual people who are on there, I think, are is really good representation for autistic people, especially in the mainstream eye. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with being cute and being different and all of that. But I think when it came to the production of that show, just watching the reactions of other neurotypical people in my life talking about it, they did quite often describe it in this very like infantilizing cutesy way, or they may react to different aspects of that autistic person's displaying them as themselves and going like, oh, that's, they're funny, they're cute, you know, even if they're being an asshole, like, they'll just be like, <laughs> oh, they're, they're, they're interesting, they're very quirky, they're cute. I'm like, really? I, I thought they were just being like, really rude. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh my God. So I'm not saying that any of, any of the people who are on it did anything wrong. I just think the production choices in that could be a little bit more favourable, a little bit more mature, perhaps. One of the more difficult aspects of infantilization that I've experienced is in relationships, in romantic relationships. I've had some experiences where people have almost forced their support and their help upon me without my consent. Something that I asked would ask them not to do because I want to do myself, 
they would continue to do for me because they saw me as this kind of help, helpless person. It's not to say that I don't appreciate people doing things for me, and I'm not talking about those odd little things that you would do for your partner just to kind of show your love and, you know, those kind of acts of service related things. But I'm talking about real things like to do with how I live my life, what my routine looks like. I've, I've had experiences where people have just kind of thought to themselves, all right, that they're going to manage my life. You know, I'm an autistic person, I'm helpless, I can't do certain things, and so I'm going to do everything for them. I'm going to manage them, I'm going to tell them what to do, I'm going to do all of these things, and it's really pro probably the most toxic aspects of being infantilized is in those very intimate relationships. Everything that I've explained thus far about infantilization can also occur in those romantic relationships alongside with forcing help on someone, forcing the person to accept them as a supporter, as like a, a main sort of staple in how they organize their life. Although it might seem like something that's quite nice and quite good, if it was something that I'd ask someone to do, something that I want someone to do for me and something that they can help me with, then that's great. But not things that are close to me, things that I want to have control about, I quite like to have a sense of independence. I quite like to have a sense of control over my own life, the things that I do. And some of those things, some of those boundaries, some of those decisions that I make over my life have often been undermined. It's kind of a hard one because, again, it does seem on the outside to be something, and I think to most people, something that might be quite nice. But when someone has that level of control over you, and does so many of those things that you, that you want to do for yourself, you can often lose those skills over time. And it kind of makes you to a certain degree reliant on that other person, which is not something that felt very, very comfortable to me as an adult, as an autistic person. All of these infantilizing aspects that I've spoke about prior can also be applied to workplace dynamics with managers and other people and you know, there's obviously a lot of different aspects of loneliness and um, isolation and bullying that can also prop up in the workplace. But the infantilizing aspect can definitely be an issue, especially if you are open about being autistic. To some people, not everybody, of course. I really want to drive this home because I feel like this aspect of autistic infantilization is not really talked about in a lot of the stuff that I've seen. And it's the act of sort of dismissing someone's wrongdoings, dismissing someone's behaviours, and not holding them to standards of morality that we would hold other adults, other human beings at. I think this is sort of like a, a counter-movement, sort of a counter-stigma to already existing stigma about what autistic people are like as being unempathic, as being sort of like devil children, as being immoral. Um, you see that a lot, particularly in like religious places in the US. But because of this existing stigma, which is very, very wrong, people have kind of gone the opposite way to the point where they sort of highlight autistic people as being these angelic, benevolent angels that can't do anything wrong. And I think looking at autistic people in both sides of this as being like devils, versus like angels, I think both of these views are fairly infantilizing because autism is not tied to someone's morality. Autistic people can do good things and autistic people can do bad things. Autistic people can be honest, autistic people can lie. I think it is pretty infantilizing because that's generally the way that you treat children. You know, you say that you, you sort of tell them off and you, you put boundaries in place and you, you teach them about different aspects of living and life, but to some degree, you don't really hold them as accountable to things that they've done wrong, to things that they've done incorrect, because they're kids, reasonable. They're, they're not developed fully. They're in this, this stage of learning, this stage of life that every single human being has been through. And so people are a lot more kind of lenient when it, when it comes to stuff like that. But this mentality that we have around kids sometimes gets transferred to disabled adults and autistic adults. I find it to be quite infantilizing, if not ab 
outright dangerous to other people in that autistic person's life. If that autistic person is being abusive and horrible and doing some really bad things and integrating themselves into various degrees of criminal activity, then they should be held up to that standard because that's wrong and they're adults. This isn't to say that in all situations they're doing something wrong. Like a lot of people see autistic people as doing something wrong, particularly in social contexts when we are being direct, when we are being honest, when we don't do those white lies that a lot of people do. And I'm not talking about things like that, things that make sense. There is a, a fine balance to strike between having an understanding that perhaps our perception when it comes to complex social things like that, and the way that we interact in those situations might be a bit different, but it doesn't excuse every part of our behavior. If we understand that something's wrong and there's something that we shouldn't do, we should not be excused for doing that because we understand it. We can conceptualize it. We can make the decision. We can do that thing. So I hope this has given you a little bit of an insight into the world of autistic infantilization. If you do have any points that you want to share, please put them down in the comments. Anything that I've missed out, any situations, any experiences, I'd really love to hear them. And if you would be so kind, please make sure to like, subscribe, and consider becoming a member for as little as 99p. I'm currently self-employed, so I'm trying to make it in the online spaces. So any encouragements in the form of monetary compensation for what I'm doing, any support that you can give me would be really, really helpful. And you get a bunch of cool perks and early access to videos and, and exclusive sort of members videos and badges and emojis and all that lovely stuff. And yeah, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and I'll see you later.